Good evening. Our topic tonight, as you can hardly have missed uh, from Terry's video, is the testimony of Jesus and the remnant and how the whole concept of remnant relates to Adventist identity. Before I begin, just a small piece of housekeeping. Several people have been asking me, remembering that in the past uh, there was a series of tapes in which I had all the material from about four different classes on Revelation at the seminary, and uh, so I I brought that uh, a copy of that with me. If you want to have a look at it afterward, you're welcome to come down the front. Perhaps, Eddie, just hold it up in the air so they see where it is. Okay, so you can have a look at it uh, if you'd like. Be happy to chat with you about that later. All right, testimony of Jesus and the remnant. Key text, of course, Revelation 12 and verse 17. The dragon was angry with the woman. and He went away to make war with the remnant of her seed, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And as you can see, remnant, testimony of Jesus are highlighted here. These are the two terms we want to talk about tonight. Revelation 12, 17, as much as any other text in the book of Revelation, is central to Adventist identity. And we have seen ourselves in the concept of remnant, in the concept of testimony of Jesus. But in this day and age, many people have questioned some of these identifications. So we want to take a fresh look at these tonight. What is the testimony of Jesus? Is the testimony of Jesus the prophetic gift, as Adventists have traditionally said? Is it the book of Revelation? Some people suggest, no, testimony of Jesus is not Ellen White, it's not prophetic gift, it's actually the book of Revelation itself, that's the purpose of the concept. Is it the gospel? A good friend of mine teaches, no, testimony of Jesus is actually the gospel message itself. So we need to take a fresh look and see what we make of uh, these various suggestions. Who are the remnant? Is the remnant the Seventh-day Adventist church? As uh, we often uh, have, have said. Is it the churches of John's day? Is it all Christians of all ages? Is it an unspecified end-time entity. If you've traveled around the world as much as I have in the last 10, 20 years, you've heard all of these ideas in the Adventist context. Which of these really comes the closest to the book of Revelation? Testimony of Jesus, the remnant. What does the Bible have to say? Let's start with the testimony of Jesus. And of course, the most famous text is found in Revelation 19.10. Testimony of Jesus seems to be defined there in the following words. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And of course, for Adventists, what is the spirit of prophecy? The writings of Ellen White. So if the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, then that brings things home where we want them to be. There's one small problem, which isn't always obvious in translation. This may sound good to us, but actually the original text is just a little bit different. The testimony of Jesus in the Greek is actually the spirit of the prophecy. That's just a little bit different. Spirit of prophecy, spirit of the prophecy. Prophecy, And that concept of the prophecy is kind of like, if you're familiar with your English grammar, demonstrative pronoun, the spirit of this prophecy, the prophecy of the book of Revelation. So many people read that text and they say, no, it's not saying the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It's saying the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of the book of Revelation. This is how the book of Revelation came about. So that's why some people say testimony of Jesus is not the prophetic gift, It's the book of Revelation, based on chapter 19.10. Well, let's take a closer look. 
I believe the testimony of Jesus is actually more clearly defined in the opening verses of the book of Revelation. And so let's go there to Revelation 1 and verses 1 to 3. And I think if we look carefully at this text, we will see more clearly what the testimony of Jesus is. Reading the text with you, Revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants what must take place soon, and he signified it, sending it to, uh, through his angel to his servant John, who testified concerning the word of God and the testimony of Jesus which he saw. Blessed is the one who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy, and in the original it's the definite article, the words of the prophecy, clearly talking about the book of Revelation. Blessed is the one who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy, book of Revelation, and keep the things that are written in it for the time is near. What is the testimony of Jesus? Is it the book of Revelation? Is it the gospel? Is it something else? What is it? I'd like you to notice as you look at this text that there's actually a chain of revelation. You notice that? Revelation isn't just dropping down out of heaven straight to us, but it actually comes sort of bouncing down through a series of steps. Take a look at this. Notice the chain. You have the revelation of Jesus Christ, which what? God gave to him. All right, so there's something is passed from God to Jesus. And then it goes from Jesus through his angel to his servant John. So it's passed from God to Jesus, passed from Jesus through an angel to John. And then, as John writes it out, it goes down to his servants, to the believers, to the members of the church. Now keep that text in mind. We'll be right back to it. But I want to show you visually what is going on here. There's a chain of revelation. God gives something to Jesus. Then Jesus passes it through his angel to John, and then John, through the writing, hands this revelation on to the church. Can you see that? In Revelation 1, 1 to 3, there's a chain of revelation. Now, where is the book of Revelation in this chain? Which part? The third part, from John to the church. John writes it down, sends it to the church. All right? That's part three of the chain. First, something gives uh, from God to Jesus, then from Jesus to John, then from John to the church. Now, keep that in mind. We'll be back to this chart in just a minute. So you have the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's step one in the chain, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Step two in the chain is the testimony of Jesus. Step three in the chain, the words of this prophecy. Now let me just stop for a minute and, and give you just a little bit of seminary education. Okay? You paid good money to come here, so uh, you're going to get something in return. All right? That you would have to pay tuition for if you came to Andrews. All right? One of the differences between exegesis, as we call it, to taking the text, trying to draw out of the text what is in it, one of the differences between exegesis and perhaps what we usually do with the Bible, seeking our own understanding from it, which is good. Both of those are good. But exegesis, the whole point of exegesis is trying to understand what the text is saying. And the best way to describe what the text is saying is to use the language of the text. Now what we sometimes do is we say, well, the revelation of Jesus, that's this. And the testimony of Jesus, that's that. And the words of this prophecy, that's something else. We define our things and then we sort of move on. We say, well, this is uh, the Catholic Church and that's America and that's here and there. And all those things are good. But when you stop to look at the text itself, to let the text unfold itself, sometimes you see things that you missed. Remember the other night? Actually, it was yesterday morning. When you fly in from America, you're not sure what day of the week. You're not even sure what week it is sometimes. I remember getting on a plane sometime on Tuesday, and I got here on Friday, and I don't know what happened between. Anyway, <laughs> you know, say, but remember what happened yesterday morning. I talked about 
the dragon, the sea beast, and the land beast, and we saw a trinity there and all of that, that's been there in the text. That's been noticed for a hundred years or more. But Uriah Smith never noticed it. Why? Because every time he came to a new symbol, he said, well, that means something going on in history. And so the interpretation was a series of historical events and then didn't stay with the text long enough to see the story that was in the text. Now, that's, there's nothing wrong with applying it to history. The point is simply this. Exegesis asks us to look at the text and stay with it long enough that we see the story that's happening there. And the payoff tonight is that we'll have a deeper understanding of testimony of Jesus and remnant because we're seeing it within its original context. Okay? So that's, that's something we do uh, at the seminary when people raise questions about the Bible. Now, what does the Bible really teach about this? They don't want to say, what does the Adventist church teach? They don't want us to say, what does Andrews teach? Or what does John Pauline teach? They want to say, what does the Bible say? All right. So we want to look carefully at this text. And you'll notice that each level of the chain has a name. When God gives something to Jesus, it's called the revelation of Jesus. When Jesus gives something to John, it's called the testimony of Jesus. When John gives a book to the church, it's called the words of this prophecy. So the text itself gives a name to each of the three steps in the chain. And so here you see it. What God gives to Jesus, revelation of Jesus, testimony of Jesus, words of this prophecy. All right, let's go one step further now. What is the revelation of Jesus? It is that which God gave to him. That's the revelation of Jesus. What is the testimony of Jesus? It's what John saw. All right? And what's the words of this prophecy? It's the things written down in the book. You see that? So let's go back to the chart. The revelation of Jesus is what God gave. Testimony of Jesus is what John saw. Words of this prophecy is what John wrote. So I'll ask you now. Testimony of Jesus, what is it? Is it the book of Revelation? No. Why? Where's the book of Revelation? It's what John wrote. Stage three. What is the testimony of Jesus? The testimony of Jesus is what John saw, not what John wrote. It was the visionary gift that John received from Jesus. The testimony of Jesus is not about the book of Revelation itself. It is rather about the process through which God inspires the prophet, gives him the vision from which then he can write the testimonies that God has given him to write. So the testimony of Jesus, in fact, is the visionary gift that God gave John. When John received this visionary gift, what was the result? He wrote out the book of Revelation. All right? But the testimony of Jesus is not the book of Revelation. It is a process that God has often used to provide information to human beings. It is the visionary gift that is in mind. It is not the book of Revelation itself. So you see... By expanding our search in Revelation, we get a clearer picture of what the testimony of Jesus is. In the light of this, other texts in Revelation now make some more sense. Take a look, for example, at Revelation 22, verses 8 and 9. It says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them... I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed these things to me. He said to me, see that you don't. I'm a fellow servant of you and of your brothers, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. All right, what does this text tell us? It tells us, first of all, that John is clearly associated with what? The prophets. So John is what? He is a prophet who has visions. 
All right. Do you have to have visions to be a prophet? Well, what about Luke? Is Luke a prophet? That's a good question. I have to think about that myself. <laughs> Luke didn't have any visions. Why did Luke write his gospel? Because a friend of his, Theophilus, needed a clearer picture of the story of Jesus. I have a theory, by the way. My suspicion is that Theophilus is Nero's prosecuting attorney. And Paul is going to trial in Rome. And the prosecuting attorney needs to prepare the emperor for the trial. So he says, can you give us documentation about this whole story of Jesus and the church and what this is all about? You know, Luke Acts seems to write beautifully that way. That's a possibility, anyway. Because the Acts ends with Paul awaiting trial. That's the very point in time when Luke Acts is written, in the context of Paul's trial. Anyway, uh, maybe, maybe not. But that's an interesting sideline that one might get. But Luke doesn't have any visions. What does he say? He says, I want to tell, write this thing because my friend needs to know some things. So how did I go about it? I read some stuff. I interviewed people. I talked to eyewitnesses, and then I put this together. No visions. But it's in the Bible. It's inspired. So the Holy Spirit can guide a person in research to uh, bring about the truths that God wants us to have. So anyway, uh, do you have to have visions to be a prophet? Uh, perhaps not. But there is a visionary gift. John had it. That is very clear. God used visions to communicate to John and through John. And John here is clearly associated with the prophets, among whom were many, certainly, that had visions. Revelation 19.10 is interesting because it uses almost the same language as Revelation 22. It says, I fell before his feet to worship him, and he said to me, See that you don't. I'm a fellow servant of you and of your brothers who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Now you compare this text with Revelation 22, as I'm doing here, and you'll see something very interesting. These two texts are almost the same. See that you don't. See that you don't. I'm a fellow servant of you and of your brothers, the prophets. What does it say here? Of your brothers who have the testimony of Jesus. So what is the testimony of Jesus? It is a prophetic gift that God uses to communicate revelation to human beings who are called prophets and possessors of the testimony of Jesus. So come back to Revelation 19.10. It says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of the prophecy. What is this text saying? In the Greek, this word the can be used in two different ways. Hope you don't mind a little seminary material here, but I think it will help us to, to, to focus in on what is happening here. The can be used in two ways. It can be used as a demonstrative pronoun, like the word this in English. Testimony of Jesus is a spirit of this prophecy, book of Revelation. Or it can designate an abstract concept. One of the interesting things about the French language is that in the French language, abstract concepts Use the article, which doesn't happen in English. For example, love. That's an abstract, you know, abstract concept. Love. You know, beauty. Joy. You see, in French, they have the definite article. The love. The beauty. The joy. And Greek is the same way. So sometimes the use of the in Greek doesn't mean a specific item, but it's an expression of abstract idea. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So when translators come to this text, the question is, should they translate the or shouldn't they? It depends on what the testimony of Jesus is. What is the testimony of Jesus? It is 
the prophetic gift. It is the Spirit that inspires the prophets. You'll see different translations like that. Revelation 1, 1 to 3 has helped us to clarify. Testimony of Jesus is not the book of Revelation. The appropriate translation is, in fact, what most of your Bibles have. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Using it like a demonstrative pronoun, as some critics of Adventism have done, is not the appropriate way to handle the text. Revelation 1 makes it clear the testimony of Jesus is about the prophetic gift. All right, so let's get back to Revelation 12, 17. What is this text saying? When it says, the remnant of her seed are those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Does that mean that they have the book of Revelation? That wouldn't be so unique, would it? Does it mean they have the gospel? Well, a lot of people have the gospel. Does it mean that they have the gift of prophecy in their midst? I believe so. I believe that what John is saying about the remnant is that they will possess a gift similar to his. John has the testimony of Jesus. John has the spirit of prophecy. And he says, down the line, one day before Jesus comes, there will arise a remnant, and that remnant will possess a gift like the one I'm using here. A visionary gift that will give information preparing the world for the end of time. Careful exegesis, careful study of the text suggests that the traditional Adventist understanding here is the appropriate one. The gift that John has is a visionary prophetic gift. Ellen White is not like Luke so much as she is like John, receiving visions and then sharing what those visions are. Can Ellen White act like Luke sometimes? Did Ellen White ever do research? Did she ever copy stuff? So did Luke. And simply because you do research doesn't mean you're not inspired. You see? So Ellen White actually has a, has a very expansive ministry. Visions are part of it, but she can also do research. She also can travel around, visit different places, including New Zealand, and out of those experiences help shape a church into the form that we understood it today. I believe that John, looking forward on the pages of history, is aware that the end time people of God will receive a prophetic gift. And you know, some of our pioneers had an interesting way to talk about it. Because they had critics back then who would say things like the Bible and the Bible only. You know, don't follow some woman who has visions and so forth. And they said, the Bible has everything we need to know. Is that true? Does the Bible have everything we need to know? And if so, why do we need Ellen White? You know what our pioneers said to that? There is a captain of a ship. The captain of the ship receives a book of instructions that will take care of him through the entire journey. He's going to go, let's say, from New Zealand to America. All right? And in that book are instructions for the entire trip, exactly what stars ought to be in what place, exactly what kind of speed they should be going, where they should watch out for certain currents and things like that. The book contains all the instructions. The book is everything the pilot needs. And when he gets to San Francisco Bay, there are some unique issues in getting into San Francisco Bay. And so the book that the pilot has says, when you get to San Francisco Bay, slow down just before you get under the bridge and wait, and a boat will come out to meet you, and that boat will contain a pilot. The pilot will take over and steer the ship into your dock. Now when the captain gets to San Francisco, should he say, my book is all that I need? I'm not going to take any nonsense from any pilot who comes on board? Or is the captain going to say, the book tells me 
that if I want to get safely to shore, a pilot is coming, and I must trust that pilot to bring me in the last stretch. You see? Adventists believe that the Bible is a sufficient rule for faith. The Bible is all that we need, but the Bible does point ahead and suggest that in the last days, God's people will have a special gift that will be like that pilot helping us make it through the final stretch. The Bible is truly everything we need, but the Bible also points us to the gifts of the Spirit and says the church will be safe as long as the ongoing work of the Spirit is respected in relation to the Bible. So the two are not contradictory. The two can work together. A visionary, prophetic gift. The office of a New, New Testament-style prophet like John is prophesied in Scripture for God's last day people, for the remnant. Well, who then are the remnant? Is the remnant the Seventh-day Adventist denomination? That certainly fits characteristics of this text. One of them is the presence of a prophet like John. Another is emphasis on commandment keeping. Another is emphasis on the faith of Jesus, Revelation 14, 12. And Adventists have always pointed to these characteristics and said, look, the remnant of the book of Revelation is us. We are the ones who have this visionary gift. We are the ones who keep the commandments. We are the ones who have the faith of Jesus. But there are critics who have come along and said, not so fast. In fact, increasing numbers of Adventists themselves are uncomfortable equating the Adventist structure. You know what I mean by structure? The system with all of its levels and so on. Equating that with the remnant of Revelation. One of the reasons many Adventists are uncomfortable today, we talked about yesterday the postmodernism. In today's world, the amazing thing is that the most difficult concept for people to grasp is the remnant concept. Now, many of the people who have worked in evangelism know that historically there have been testing truths. And what are the testing truths in evangelistic meetings? Sabbath, state of the dead, tithing. Why are those testing truths? Because those are the points in an evangelistic series when somebody who's listening and is all excited about these new truths suddenly begins to say, oh boy, if I get into this, it's going to change everything. Am I really willing to do that? You see? Those are testing truths. They stop people in their tracks and they say, boy, I'm not so sure about this. I better talk it over with my minister. Or I better talk it over with my priest. Or I better talk it over with my husband or my wife. You see, people start getting cold feet at the testing truths. But those testing truths were particularly for another generation, which is now aging today. And the interesting thing I'm discovering around the world, in many, many places, is that the most difficult concept to accept today is not tithing, or the state of the dead or the Sabbath, it's the remnant. Because you see, the younger generation has been schooled in the idea that you don't put other people down. If you have a point, say your point, but don't knock everybody else in order to do it. And so the very process by which we've said, you know, this is the true church and so on, and people say, that's kind of arrogant. I don't know about that. I remember one day, I was in my garden the back of the house, and there's a fence. The neighbors have dogs. Okay, any dog lovers here? <laughs> well, I'll keep my mouth shut then. <laughs> Our neighborhood was great until large barking dogs moved in about 10 years ago, and now my wife can't sleep at night without a noisy fan on or something like that. Anyway, I, I said I would stop. I will. <laughs> All right. But I was standing in the garden. There was this fence there, and the neighbor comes up. And he's, he's a young man, about 10 years younger than me. What are you laughing about? <laughs> the Maori said, I look a lot younger in person. 
It's the screen that makes me look old. Okay. Anyway, you talk to them. <laughs> but a uh, young man comes across and says, hey, he says, you'll be interested to know I'm considering becoming a Seventh-day Adventist. I says, oh, that's great. That's wonderful. How did that happen? And he, he told about some meetings he attended and so forth. He says, but there's one thing that's holding me back. And I says, what's that? He says, this remnant church business. He says, it just sounds so arrogant. He says, I, I, just, I just don't think that that's right. What would you have said to him at that point? I'll share with you what I said to him in just a moment. All right. Increasing numbers of Adventists even are uncomfortable equating the Adventist system with the remnant of Revelation, the remnant church concept. And it's certainly become a serious barrier in the minds of many seekers in the secular community. And my neighbor was an example of that. Uh, one of the more mainstream culture in North America. And he just says, you know, it's the one thing that bothers me about Adventists. Is this, this idea, you know, you've got it all. You know, and, and nobody else has anything. He said, he said, that just doesn't seem right to me. Well, the General Conference is not unaware of this problem. And for many years, people have been exploring the issue and saying, is there perhaps a better way to say it? Is there some other concept we can use? And here's a suggestion that has come. Rather than using the language, the remnant church, the suggestion has been made, to use the language, the church of the remnant. Does that look different to you in any way? Does that give a slightly different impression? My neighbor across the fence. I said, hmm, the remnant church, that bothers you. I says, what if, I, what if we called it the church of the remnant? You know what he said? Oh, he says, that makes all the difference in the world. He says, that I can accept. Why? What is the difference? Church of the remnant does not imply that only Adventists are saved. It doesn't imply that only Adventists are part of God's end time people. Church of the remnant rather says the Adventist church is that body of people that God is going to use to create his end time remnant, which is a future worldwide entity. Are you comfortable with that solution? By the way, <laughs> I remember sharing this with, with a group of evangelists um, in California once, and there were several evangelists from Mexico that were there. And I remember saying you know, about the remnant, and one gentleman got up, and he says, I don't know what we're talking about here. He says, where I come from, remnant church is not a problem. So we're wasting time here. That's always fun when you get those kind of responses, you know. And I said, well, you know, maybe in Mexico it's not a problem. But in other places it is a problem. You know what happened afterward? Four or five younger evangelists from Mexico all came up to me and they said, don't listen to him. It's a huge problem in Mexico. He just doesn't want to face the facts. You know, so, well, I don't know who to believe now. <laughs> but having traveled on six continents and, and been participating in the Adventist church in all of these various venues, it just seems to me increasingly this is a problem. It is an issue that we have to look at. And so the question I would ask is what does the Bible teach? Which of these expressions is closest to the book of Revelation? Because that's where we really want to be. And how can we express these things? Let's take a look. If you use this term, church of the remnant, at least it seems to resolve the stumbling block of high-handed exclusivism. But is it biblical? Which of these two is more accurate to the biblical text? Let's take a look at the full picture of Revelation's remnant. Is Revelation's remnant possessing the visionary gift? Yes. Is Revelation's remnant emphasizing the commandments? Yes. Is Revelation's remnant possessing the faith of Jesus? Yes. Sounds great. But is that the full picture? Let's take a look at a couple other things. 
According to the book of Revelation, the remnant, whoever they are, is the object of worldwide attention. The remnant, whoever they are, has a message of worldwide significance. In other words, everybody's talking about it. It is the message that is on CNN that is galvanizing people's discussion around the world. Is that the case with the Adventist church today? Let's take a closer look at these last two. Object of worldwide attention. Where did I get that from? Revelation 12, 17. The dragon gathers the forces of the entire world against the remnant. So the remnant is the object of enmity of every society, every culture around the world. Revelation 13. It's the focus of a universal boycott. Cannot buy or sell. Revelation 17, 14. The remnant is the focus of a worldwide coalition that is seeking to destroy it. All right? So the remnant is the object of worldwide attention. What is the reality of the Adventist church? Remember the 1040 window? We heard about that yesterday afternoon. In the 1040 window, you have three and a half billion people. Of those people, 1% is Christian and 0.001% is Seventh-day Adventist. In the 1040 window, are we the object of attention? Don't even know we exist. A bare majority of Americans recognize the name Seventh-day Adventist. And most of those have some very strange ideas about what we believe. Only a small fraction, about 3 to 6 percent, has accurate information about what's uh, what uh, Seventh-day Adventists believe. And this is America. If you go to India, China, Middle East, even New Zealand, the numbers are probably quite a bit smaller yet. Adventists rarely make the news. We heard a little bit earlier, we sometimes do. Was that sects in the city? Uh, i, I got to take my hat off to whoever came up with that one. <laughs> anyway, Adventists rarely make the news. So much so that we put it on a camp meeting whenever we do. All right. So the Adventist church, if the Adventist church is the remnant, it's not quite the remnant the way Revelation portrays it. A message of worldwide significance. Where do we get that from? Revelation 14, 7. It is a message to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Revelation 10, 11, you must prophesy again concerning peoples and nations and language groups and many kings. In other words, the message of the remnant will be one that everybody's talking about. What is the reality in today's world? Very few scholars are studying Adventist thought. Rather than being the center of attention, Adventist thought is not even being looked at. I'm in a position to know that. I happen to be the president, actually will become president in a few months of the Chicago Society of Biblical Research. It's probably the first time an Adventist has ever been president of the society. It's a great honor, a great privilege. The society's been going for 120 years. A very prestigious society of people who study the Bible. There's a large number of uh, Jesuits in the society a large number of Lutherans, Methodists, many others, and there are some Adventists. In that society, Adventist thought is not a major focus of attention. Society of Biblical Literature, even larger and more prestigious group, some uh, 5,000 members. These are people who teach at Harvard and Yale and places like that. All right? Adventist thought is almost never brought in focus. That's simply a reality. I wish I could report differently. I'm there. I mingle with these people. I know what's going on. And to suggest that Adventist thought is galvanizing the world's attention is true in some places, some contexts. In the terms of scholarship, though, there are very few that find the Adventist message gripping and, uh, and uh, center of attention. There are very few Seventh-day Adventists 
at the highest levels of learning. There are some, particularly in the field of archaeology. Adventists have a, a way out of proportion influence. But in most areas of scholarship, Adventists are very little represented. Historicism, the way that we read Bible prophecy, we're going to talk more about that later this week. We're going to take a look at historicism and, and uh, try to work with the text and uh, do it in some fresh ways. But the way that we usually use Daniel and Revelation in our evangelistic meetings is not recognized by scholarship outside the Adventist church. When we had our meetings with the Lutheran World Federation, we presented papers on the study of Revelation. They were just saying, how do you ever read it that way? It doesn't make any sense to us. And the folk at the General Conference turned to me and says, could you please start back from scratch and write up you know, the reasons why we do this? And I said, fine, tell me where I can find it in the literature and I'll add that to my paper. And nobody could think of anything. And in several years I have looked and I have never seen a place where Adventists have clearly laid out the grounds for historicist study. What we did is we inherited it from William Miller and we never justified it. Well, we're doing that now and I'm going to share the results of that recent research with you uh, later on this week. But when you go to the world of secular scholarship, historicism as an idea is not recognized as a valid approach to Daniel and Revelation. So this is a reality that uh, we have to face. Day of worship is not a major issue. If you were to go down the streets in Auckland and interview people on the street and you say, what do you think? Should people worship on Saturday or on Sunday? What would the typical New Zealander say to that question? What's wrong with you guys? You know, why should we worship at all, right? You see, the idea back in a hundred years ago Everybody was talking about it. Every time an Adventist evangelist came to town, people are debating, should you worship on Saturday or Sunday? Today, people are saying, you know, who, what kind of people talk about stuff like that? You know, see? So there's a serious challenge here that we face. Even faithful SDAs sometimes struggle understanding 1844 and the issues surrounding that. Both here and around the world, we impact relatively small percentages of society. That's not true everywhere. Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Jamaica, Kenya, there are places in the world where Adventist thought and Adventist people have influence way out of proportion to the size. In Papua New Guinea, I understand that probably there are more Adventists in government than any other faith uh, that is there. It's out of proportion in its size. But in most areas of the world, particularly the so-called Western countries, Adventism has a very, very small influence in society. The remnant of revelation seems to be bigger than that. It's the SDA church as such, the end time remnant. It would seem hard to maintain in the face of these realities that this is it, nothing more. Remnant of Revelation seems to be bigger than that. The evidence of Revelation, I summarize in this way. Looks like I need to add a letter there. The remnant of Revelation would seem to be a worldwide, spiritual, last day group drawn from every worldwide organization and government. In other words, at the end of time, the remnant of will be the whole body of people who come together in the truth of God in the final stages of earth's history. Well then, what about the Adventist church? What about us who are part of the official membership? What is our role? What is our identity? What is our mission as the church of the remnant? I'd like to suggest the following. As the church of the remnant, we are a body of people called by God at the time of the end to be the bearer of the message that will gather people from every nation, tribe, language, and ethnic group into God's great spiritual worldwide last day remnant. The church of the remnant is recognized not so much by what it is or who it is, but by what? The message 
that it carries. That's why the Adventist message is so crucial to identity. We must pass it on to our children and to our grandchildren. We must keep that message before our eyes. We must be faithful to that message because the message is who we are. We are the people God has called to give the message that will create the final day people of God. We are the embryo, if you wish, of the end time remnant. Is this disappointing? Is this not the role that we would like to play? Yes, it is a humble role. We're God's time of the end servants. The focus is not on how great we are, how special we are, but rather that God has shared a message and we've been willing to carry that message. And that's a wonderful thing. That's a glorious thing to serve God in that way. We bear a vital and unique message. Nobody else is giving this message. Nobody else is out there sharing what is in the book of Revelation in this way. Do we need somebody to pat us on the head and say, you're the greatest people on earth? Or is it sufficient to know that we're approved by God? And that as we carry His message, we have a vital role, a humble role. There's no guarantee that we ourselves will make it. No guarantee. Ellen White says, great lights will go out. There's no guarantee that every office will be faithful, that every college and university will remain faithful to God. It's not guaranteed. There's no room here for arrogance. What counts is the message, and as long as we're faithful to that message, we'll make it through. Here's an interesting little vignette. In these discussions with the Lutheran World Federation, the General Conference came to realize that if we're going to be honest with them and be straightforward as to who we really are, we need to talk about the mark of the beast. So they said, who can we get to study the mark of the beast with the leaders of the Lutheran World Federation? They picked up the phone and called me. And I wasn't out of town, unfortunately. <laughs> one of the greatest nightmares I have is that one day the papacy will want to have discussions with the Adventist Church and the mark of the beast. Am I going to be near the phone on that day? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, say, because it's one thing to share the message with people who don't have the training and the preparation so on to really challenge you. But when you're dealing with Bible scholars and Daniel and Revelation, you're presenting the mark of the beast. You'd better have your ducks in a row. All right, so whatever you may think of what I'm presenting here these evenings, I'll tell you, it's been tested in some very challenging places. And I'll never forget the moment. There was one scholar from Germany, a Lutheran man, and he heard the, the mark of the beast. He kind of lost it. You know, he says, he says, what sort of arrogance is this? He says, I thought you were a church. I was coming away from here prepared to say Adventist church are, are good Christian people like anybody else. And now you come with this. He says, it makes you look like just a cult, a sect. He says, he says I withdraw my approval of you. And he began to cry. He says, you, you talk about this mark of the beast. You say, oh, I'm okay because I'm a follower of Jesus, but my grandchildren, they're going to be lost because they're Lutherans. They're going to have the mark of the beast because they're Lutherans. He says, I would rather be lost than my grandchildren be saved. They began to cry. He was hurt. And one of our dear brethren responded at that tense moment. Here you have two sides, just frozen in tension. He responded at that moment. He says, we don't care what you think. You can call us a sect if you want. He says, we don't care. He says, that, that matters nothing to us. And, and he just basically said, your problem. We don't care. And I was here kind of like, mm -mm. what are we going to do? <laughs> and suddenly a meeting that had gone so well for several sessions. I mean, we have so much in common. The gospel, you know, there's many other things. There's a lot of things to celebrate. And suddenly, there was a wall between us. And I'll never forget, the head of the Lutheran de de delegation is the Bishop of Oslo, Norway. He said, brethren, on both sides, 
We've been together through many things. We know that God has been with us in these discussions. Let's not just throw it away for one moment. He said, let's try to work together. It was, it was, an, it was a beautiful example of Christian... Uh, by the way, he was named the Bishop of Oslo that week while we were meeting together. And he says, I get to celebrate this great moment in my life with my Adventist friends. So we had a party celebrating that he was now Bishop of Oslo. This was kind of a neat moment. An incredible man. A man that I admire a great deal. But here we have the tension. And I was praying quietly to God, how can I defuse this tension? How can I bring things back together again? Because I was really the one to blame in a way. I just told the straight testimony, you know. And I told that, you know, there's, you cannot just assume everyone's going to be saved because they named the name of Christ. There will be issues that arise in the end time that will split people down. And then I believe God gave me this answer. And I said to him, brother, it was just before lunch. I said, brother, you're a grandfather and you worry about your grandchildren. I want you to know, I'm a father. Gee, I'm not that old. (laughs) I'm a father and I worry about my children too, just as you worry about your grandchildren. As I want you to know this, the Adventist teaching on Mark of the Beast does not assume that we are going to make it and everyone else is going to be lost. Rather, we teach the following, and that is that the final message of earth's history will split every denomination, including ours. Isn't that what Ellen White teaches? It will split every denomination, including ours. There'll be great lights that will go out, and there'll be others that come in. You see, we believe that in the end time it will split every denomination and that the faithful people of God from whatever background, Lutheran and Catholic and Methodist, will all come together around the message. And the ones who split off in the other direction, they will all band together and oppose the work of God. In that day, it will be no safer to be an Adventist than to be a Lutheran. So you and I can worry about our children, our grandchildren together. Because when God does his final work, will he find us faithful, is the question. And the tears were just pouring down his face. He says, says, this is good. He says, this I can accept. He says, we can be brothers and sisters in Christ. We may differ right now on what happens, but in the end, God will bring the faithful ones together. You see? So there's no guarantee, simply because I am a Seventh-day Adventist, everything's just fine. No, no. We need to be faithful to our identity. We need to be faithful to the message God has given us. And as we are faithful, others from whatever background will join us in God's great, glorious, end-time remnant. It is a calling and a gift from God to be a Seventh-day Adventist today. It is not a reason to boast. It is not a reason to think we are better than other people. But instead, it's a wonderful privilege and a humble role to play. No need to apologize. There's no need to go around and say, oh, well, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, and you know, we have some different ideas. No, there's no need to do that. God is the one who has set the message. God is the one who has put his word together. And being faithful to God doesn't call for apologies. I'm not going to apologize for being faithful to God and for sharing with Lutherans and others exactly what we believe. No need to apologize. At the same time, no reason to think we're better than somebody else. The message came to us. Praise God. The message came to you. Praise God. Is that because you're better than other people? No. God gives the message to those He will. And God uses some of us to give the message to others. That's a glorious privilege. It's a humble role. It's a wonderful responsibility that God has given us. I'm grateful to be a Seventh-day Adventist. I was born into this message. So I'm always awed by someone like my brother here who shared how recently he came to this faith. And, And in many ways, I can never fully grasp the experience that you have and and the joy that the message brings to you having come from another context. You see, I was born into this faith and I thank God 
for this faith. At the same time, I want to stay humble. I want to be studying the Word of God. I want to constantly test what I believe by His Word, lest having preached to others, I myself could be disqualified for the prize. What about you? Is it time to become ever more familiar with this message? Ever more certain of what we believe? Ever more capable of sharing with others? Is it not time? Stand with me, if you will. And we invite God to dedicate each one of us to the Adventist identity, to the destiny that God has called us to. And may God give us the grace and the strength to live that destiny for Him. Shall we pray? Lord, we are humbled as we realize how large a work remains. How many people in New Zealand don't even know that we exist. And should we approach them and try to present the message, might even say, oh, that's no interest to me. Go talk to somebody else. Lord, we live in challenging times, but we know and we believe that your hand is on the wheel. Revelation teaches us that a day will come when you will thrust us into center stage. You'll place us with this message on a worldwide stage, on CNN, in all the newspapers. Are we ready, Lord? Has that day not come because we ourselves are not ready for that responsibility? Then, Lord, we dedicate ourselves to you tonight. We will study your word. We will wrestle with these things. We will understand them so that when that day comes that you bring the nations to our attention, that we will be ready to give this message as you would have us give it. I pray, Lord, that this mighty army of North New Zealand would be prepared for the great day of God Almighty, for the battle that is to come, the spiritual battle in which your word will shine bright. May we be ready for that day. May you be with us to that end. In Jesus' name.